Please welcome our first session, What Can Healthcare Learn from Tech Industry? Conversation between Vijay Pandey, General Partner at Adresen Horowitz, and Edward Hu, Vice Chairman and Chief Investment Officer at Wuxi Abtech. Thank you, Vijay. It's good to have you here. Um, so uh, uh, this topic is very talk about the health healthcare and uh, and tech industry and how the, those both industry has been evolving and what can we learn from each other. So I noticed that healthcare and life life science industry growth has picked up speed in the past five years. Also, also healthcare industry has been using AI information technology much more than so than in the past, uh, such as the new, new modalities are quickly become mainstream therapeutics uh, evidenced by uh, Moderna and BioNTech's MRA vaccine tech, uh, development. So healthcare, health, <clears throat> health tech has also grown very quickly during the pandemic as patients and doctors are increasingly now rely on online healthcare platform. Uh, how do you compare the technology industry and healthcare lifestyle industry and what differentiates each other? Yeah, you know, this is, uh, I think one of the most important topics for the coming decade because healthcare itself has been such a challenge to scale. And if you think about it, this is an area where tech in principle should have a huge impact. Tech is great at taking a problem, handling logistics, handling complicated situations, bringing down costs. These are all attributes that we associate with the best tech companies. So it's not a surprise that tech could play a role. I think that mm -hmm. what has been the challenge is that would it? And in particular, unlike other domains, Healthcare is very complicated. It requires deep understanding of medicine and science and biology. It's not something that you can handle naively with just purely a computer science degree. And I think what we've seen most recently in the last maybe five years is this confluence between healthcare, biopharma, and tech comes from a new class of people that are deep in tech and deep in the medical or biopharma domain and that they are bringing these two, two things together and hopefully bringing the best of both worlds. Deep domain experience in, in the biology and medicine, but really an understanding of what the power of technology can be. Yeah, so also uh, this pandemic has really taught us a lesson how it actually can prevent disease from spreading or happening in the, in the population scale, right? So technology company, internet company, they're very good at actually reaching millions and millions of consumers, right, uh, very efficiently. And the healthcare traditionally happened during the doctor's clinic or hospital setting. So it's, it's quite much more limited. But when we try to cope with those kind of pandemic, you really need a technology tool when quickly yes. Uh, yes. Uh, get to every citizen, right? So the, the convergence of those two industries probably will pr profoundly impact how the future, future uh, uh, public health will be managed, right? Yeah, I, I think it's commonly seen that COVID accelerated a lot of the trends that we're seeing and a lot of the trends that people were predicting. I, I think the, the counterintuitive aspect of this is gonna be the fact that um, many areas are not really about technology or biology. It's really about what can be industrialized, what can be yes. taken from a bespoke process that requires a lot of human interaction to something that can be done at scale. And I think that's gonna be the shift. And some of that is a shift in, in mentality that in the age where let's say a cobbler made your shoes and every shoe was made specially for each person, maybe it's a slightly better shoe, maybe not, but it's very expensive to have that versus uh, a factory that can make shoes to a certain set of sizes. As we industrialize, I think the challenge in medicine in particular is how can we um, lower the costs and keep the healthcare quality constant or better? And I think therein there will have to be changes. And those counterintuitive changes will come from new things, it will come from being uh, more proactive and, and treating healthcare as not sick care, but preventive medicine. Um, many different areas will come into play as we start to make this change. Yeah, you, you said it uh, elegantly. So in, the, in that regard, what are the top three things uh, healthcare can learn from the tech industry? Yeah, no, that's a fun question. And I, I think, uh, I think one of the first things that, uh, that tech thinks a lot about is about scale. I think whenever you start any tech company um, from Apple to Google to Facebook to Amazon, it's always mm -hmm. about scale. And, right. and, the, and the beauty of tech, whether we're talking about computer science or really other areas of engineering is that it's really um, built with a scaling mentality. 
Uh, and so I think that's the obvious thing. But I, I think the other thing that maybe is maybe not as appreciated is that when we say tech, often we really mean some source of engineering. And part of the power of engineering is iterative improvement, that something can get better 10%, 15%, 20% better per year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And while that seems relatively modest, that improvement accumulates cu uh, cumulatively year after year, much like compounding interest. And it's this relatively modest year to year change that over a decade or two decades leads to enormous change. Uh, this is the power of Moore's law and that we've seen in computers for computer speed or even sizes of memory or hard drives. But also we see in biology too, this is often called Flatley's law in genomics. I yep. think anything that can have an engineering mindset can take on this property. And this is in contrast to the fact that biopharma and healthcare have the opposite property, that their cost is not decreasing exponentially, but increasing exponentially. Right. So you asked for three. So in addition to scaling and engineering, uh, I think actually one of the other things that we're going to start to see is, is a cultural difference that are really trying to think about a lot of, I think the, the best plays in tech really try to in, envision how we can really, really transform the world in, in, in very positive ways. And, uh, you know, the Google founders uh, had this uh, dream to bring all of the world's information to, to individuals, you know, in the palm of their hand. And, and the amazing thing now is that actually we very much have that in many ways. Right. And we're seeing tech style entrepreneurs come into healthcare and have those types of motivations to be able to have a healthcare system that could treat your, your grandparents the way you would treat them yourself, uh, right. to have drugs that can uh, handle disease before you get, and, and, and diagnostics can help treat cancer before it becomes serious. I, I okay. think that sort of sense of really trying to um, set the bar higher and come up with really solutions that are much more grand than incremental sort of changes is a hallmark of tech. And I think is, is a hallmark of, of these new tech plus bio healthcare entrepreneurs that are coming into the space. Yeah, great. So uh, uh, picking up on your scale uh, question, so technology industry is very good at scale. Uh, do you think the MRA technology essentially now open the door for scaling, developing either vaccine or future therapeutics uh, in, in much quicker because uh, MRA technology, the, the beauty is the whole manufacturing process, once you work it up, it's identical. Yes. If you change another vaccine, another drug, it's all just a sequence difference, right? So you yes. just drop a different sequence, but the whole manufacturing process is identical. So maybe in the future, regulatory bodies like the FDA, they would just approve your whole manufacturing process. And every time, every flu season comes, you, you just change the sequence. Yes. And you don't need to do another clinical trial to, to validate, yes. right? Yes. That, then yes. it's scale very quickly. Yeah, it's a very intriguing to imagine, and, and this might be an overblown analogy, but maybe not, a distinction between hardware, which is manufacturing and all these things, and software, right. which is the sequence. sequence and right. hardware probably requires clinical trials and, and big changes there. But software, you may have to be really careful there too, but often you might not. Uh, to make a, a tech analogy where tech is transforming another industry, uh, take an example of the Tesla car. The Tesla car is the hardware, but they do software mm -hmm. updates all the time. And right. while the hardware updates have to go through tests for safety and so on, the software updates, as long as they're not fundamentally changing the nature of safety and so on, can just, go, can just be done. So that's the, the, the vision and the fantasy. I think mm -hmm. the reality is that any large change like this has to be done carefully and done in partnership with the FDA. And I think one of the maybe most exciting and maybe underappreciated aspects is that the FDA, I think, is being very innovative themselves. And they recognize the value of being able to help save lives by uh, trying to innovate. And I think innovation yep. in biopharma coupled with innovation in the FDA, I think will be a very powerful pathway, pathway for it. Right. So this is a nice segue to the next question I, I have for you is in, in a recent podcast, uh, you did it with the 2020 Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Jennifer Doudna. Uh, the two of you discussed how biology has begun to shift from an artisanal process to an industrial one. And can you talk about more about what, is, what does this mean and how this will shape the future of drug discovery? Yeah, you know, it's really kind of um, shocking sometimes, I think, for people that are not in biology 
to go to one of the best biology labs at Stanford or MIT or Berkeley. And you go look at that lab and you'll see uh, PhD students or PhDs with lab coats doing all these things by hand. And -hmm. actually, if you went to that same lab 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago, it would largely look pretty similar. Mm -hmm. You know, actually, if you take the picture and make it black and white, it would look very similar to pictures, let's say, from 50 years or 100 years ago. And in many ways, a lot of experimental biology still is pre-industrial revolution. It's done artisanally by hand. And I think there's two challenges here. One is cultural, that it is going to be a big shift. But the second one is that while there is automation, it hasn't proven to be useful enough, I think, Mm -hmm. until fairly recently. And I think what you're starting to see is a whole new labs that are built from the ground up where um, robotic experiments are uh, combined with machine learning and artificial intelligence. And the combination is starting to create almost like a factory-like process to industrialize discovery itself. And this is a big change. And I think we're seeing this maybe more in companies than we are in academic labs. But I think this this change, I think, is going to be this big shift from a lot of biology becoming sort of serendipitous to biology becoming automated uh, and uh, and something where you know you can't guarantee discovery, but you can by making it into a process we can accelerate it. That, yeah, that's great. Because really, in the in, his, in the past uh, past several uh, decades, uh, the biology experiment is really tried by error, and you you knock down one gene and see what happened. But yes. in reality, the human biology is very complex and network effect. So yes. you really want to simultaneously study this gene turned down, turned off, what the whole network effect. And yes. then try to, right, that, that requires automation and a lot of uh, machine learning technology to, to really decipher what and it really means. Right? All the things we talked about before, we talked about tech being good at scale. This is yeah. about scale. We talked about tech being an engineering approach. This is an engineering approach. And so again, now we see these themes come to play, not in healthcare delivery, but in biopharma, where you want to scale these degree of experiments, where you might run thousands, hundreds of thousands of experiments, well-crafted such that they can go into a machine learning model. And mm-hmm. that model then helps design the next set of experiments. And I think we're starting to see this already in the early stages of protein design for identifying new targets and understanding new biology and understanding with a greater precision and accuracy than a human being could do on their own. I mean, actually, if you just even think about it, that biology is so complicated that it's hard to imagine that a human brain necessarily could load up all the data points in one's head to really understand right. in a great degree. And, and this might be one of the great opportunities for machine learning given that complexity. And so I think we're seeing just the beginning of this now in the early stages of drug design. We have great opportunities for where this could go, especially into clinical trials, into uh, matching patients into trials for helping even refer patients to the best drugs. I think in time, we will go from the early stages of biopharma all the way deep into healthcare delivery. That's right. So, uh, you recently also wrote an article to help investors and operators alike assess whether uh, new AI technology is worth investing in. And can you explain the framework that you use to determine whether AI is the right solution to a problem you're looking at to solve? What yeah, you know, yeah, this is a, a time where there is a lot of hype about AI. And it reminds me like in 2000s, uh, some companies put .com at the end of their name uh, to have a bump in the stock market, even if they weren't an internet company. Uh, there's a lot of claims about AI that um, maybe are overly strong. And, and, uh, and so, I think for this movement to really have power, we really need to know where we stand and and where things are. And and so there's a whole sort of framework that we lay out. I think one of the central things to really keep in mind is that uh, one of the most powerful aspects guiding AI is the nature of its data and the nature of the algorithms. And you hear a lot of conflicting statements. Like sometimes people will say that only the algorithms matter or only the data matter. And, And really, I think it's much more nuanced than that, that we're starting to see really Uh, that um, well-curated data that often is driven, generated for AI specifically, not sort of repurposed or reused from previously, fed into algorithms that really are deep in the the biological domain. That combination is very powerful and maybe still a little bit rare, but companies that can sort of push to that, those limits are going to be the ones that are going to be in the forefront. Yeah, in that regard, actually, uh, we talked about real-world evidence-based study to uh, really shorten the clinical development timeline. Uh, 
so if you can apply those massive data analysis and pick pick out those patients who are very relevant to this disease target or the, the therapeutic you try to apply, that can significantly shorten the number of patients, uh, shorten the time of development, also uh, probably also reduce the number of patients that we have to do a real world uh, traditional clinical trials, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a really yeah. exciting future where uh, you can start to imagine that mm -hmm. real world data will be able to both match the patient to the drug because we'll know right. better. Uh, it'll be able to help payers decide which drugs are the best drugs and when mm -hmm. they need to go. So the matching problem is not just a challenge for the patient, but for the payer as well, because you want to yeah. make sure you're, you're doing the right match there. And then finally, I, I think we'll start to hopefully get to the point where one fantasy, and this maybe is still very early, is that um, real world evidence can be used as a major supplement to clinical trials. And given the cost and delay in clinical trials, if we can come up with other means to augment them such that we can get drugs out faster and sooner, but in a way that's very systematic, methodical, uh, rigorous to, from a statistical way that we could get from RWE, that could be the best of both worlds. That I think on some extremes, people talk about um, eliminating RCTs, randomized mm -hmm. clinical trials. And that extreme seems hard to imagine, and especially for let's say phase one and possibly even phase two. But the combination of the two is clearly gonna be more powerful than um, either of them alone. And we're seeing that in some ways, payers are already doing this because they have to decide what they wanna reimburse. And it will be intriguing to see how this process becomes uh, more systematized as time, as, as, as time goes on. Yeah, great. And th there's, a, there's a new world called a digital therapeutics. And what do you think of whether digital therapeutics can play a major role in the healthcare setting? Yeah, I, digital therapies I think is very intriguing. And um, it's an interesting space because it combines aspects of, uh, uh, of, of what you'd associate with a diagnostic or a therapeutic and that it has efficacy, the process has efficacy comparable to the best drugs and has aspects like a diagnostic because usually there's input that goes into it. Um, mm -hmm. But you could argue that many aspects of digital therapeutics also is a form of um, uh, virtual healthcare delivery because you are sort of uh, taking this information and then uh, affecting some action. And we're seeing this very broadly from uh, dealing with type two diabetes, uh, musculoskeletal uh, disorders, um, smoking sensations, sleep. Uh, and I, I think it's clear that lifestyle can have a deleterious effect on health. And so, mm -hmm. and that being able to sort of modify these uh, behaviors could have a positive, therefore could have a positive effect. And the question is how to make this more systematic, how to, how to make it into something that we could have greater efficacy. In the end, if yep. you think about the causes of things like type 2 diabetes, the solution being a pharmaceutical sounds kind of odd. And I think in maybe 50 years, we'll look back at this time and feel like it was kind of crazy that we thought small molecules would be necessarily a solution to everything when yeah. lifestyle choices um, um, would be key. So for instance, in someone smoking, I don't think a small molecule drug is, is the best way to fix for, for smoking mm -hmm. necessarily. I think these are lifestyle changes. And I think the, what we're starting to realize is that healthcare is more broad than just treating people with disease. It's preventing right. disease before. And once you start thinking about it that way, now we get into this spectrum where these lifestyle interventions could have as great or greater impact on, on health than um, much about a farmer in general. Yeah, this is actually interesting. For, uh, uh, I have a, a, a several diabetic uh, uh, patient the friends. Uh, what they do is they wear this Albert uh, Diabetes uh, detection machine right, on the arm, yes. Yes. and then uh, continuously you see the your blood, uh, uh, blood glucose uh, level, and yes. then when they eat something, if something they ate suddenly yep. the, the sugar level goes up, they know this stuff I need to be careful not to eat, right? Yes. <laughs> and uh, yes. that actually fun fundamentally changed the diet. The, oh uh, yes. uh, my friend yeah. has been doing. Right? Yeah. Well, what's intriguing, by the way, is that this is not limited to people with type two diabetes. So. Uh, one of our uh, investments uh, is a company that will provide these devices for people that are not diabetic. And so I actually uh -huh. happen to have one on my arm right now. You can't see it under the jacket. <laughs> but um, I will periodically um, see this continuous readout as well. And it is just shocking how individual diet changes are. That what might be... Actually, people... Did uh, you and me eat the same thing, but uh, yes. the, the glucose will be different because our metabolism yes. may be different, yes. right? 
it's even more shocking than that. So that is and the thing that surprised me is that I'm probably I've exercised a lot during COVID. And so me today versus me in 2019 is different. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so <laughs> these changes are very complicated, not something where someone can tell you, oh, this is the perfect diet and this is a garbage diet. The question uh -huh. is, what's best for you in this moment? And I think having the data is going to be a critical change. And also, frankly, con consumers that are motivated to take that data and make a change. But luckily, it doesn't have to be bad news. So much of prevention sounds like unhappy news. It sounds like no fun, you know, no, no cake, no chocolate or whatever. When in <laughs> fact, I show you these individual diets, some things could be quite good for you. Uh, things that are surprising for me is actually ice cream turns out to be not bad. I'm not committing to an ice cream diet by any means, but I think the funny thing is that sometimes people think they are being, um, they're being good by avoiding certain items. And ironically, they avoid the things they should eat and they eat the things they shouldn't because they just uh -huh. don't. That's right. That's interesting. Okay, uh, uh, we'll, we'll be, I have a couple more questions and then we'll wrap Please. up. Uh, yeah. So how will your biotech startup investments in, evolve in the next 10 years? In the recent, you know, uh, uh, the y, uh, YC uh, incubator in the Bay Area, they, they think the, the biotech startup is going to be more like tech. Uh, uh, it will be driven really by entrepreneurs and then they, they will uh, start with small and then quickly evolve rather than the, uh, the traditional way of you, you start with a scientific founder and then you hire professional managers and then you do another A round is also 30, 50 million dollars to start with. Yeah. And that, which is makes the actual investor return much smaller compared to tech. Yeah. Well, so when I started the, the biofund at Andreessen Horowitz in 2015, this was something very much on our minds as well. And many of our investments we've made have been that style. I, I mm -hmm. think there's going to be a spectrum. I mean, uh, some companies can be very capital efficient and can be built like a tech company, uh, whereas others may require a lot of capital. And frankly, not all tech companies are as capital efficient as some software companies. Some require a lot of capital as well. It really depends on the nature of the business and the opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, but I, I think the exciting change is that you can build uh, a biotech now with low capital and it's, it's possible. And there's certain situations where that would be the best way. And also combining with the fact that there is so much that you can outsource. You can outsource the computation to AWS. You can outsource the experiments. Um, the, the joke that we've had for years amongst my friends is a, a so-called beach biotech where, you know, not that you would, but you could run the whole company from a beach with a laptop with Wi-Fi or something mm. like that. Uh, and and it's, uh, it's a bit of a joke that you'd actually do this by the beach. But the fact is that you can do so much virtually now that it, it is... Uh, really an intriguing time. With that said, I think some of the, the biggest companies still will have rounds where maybe the initial rounds will be uh, small, but the later rounds will get big. But, you know, that's also common in tech companies. I, I think the deep question is, how can we build value and grow rapidly such that this company could start off small and modest, but really have a huge impact over time? And I think maybe apart from the small initial cost, I think that's the other thing that we're seeing is that these new style of tech and biology, tech and healthcare companies have the potential to have rapid growth and therefore rapid impact. So, so does that mean in the future, uh, will drug discovery be as simple as, as efficient as developing apps uh, in the 10, 10 years, 20 years to come? I think, well, how, what will be similar and what will be different? I think uh, per our uh, discussion just a few minutes ago, I think as we start to develop more of an engineering process, there'll be many more cases where next generation drugs can take advantage of the previous generation, um, not just in development, but in regulatory. So we're seeing this already in CAR-T, where CAR-T is a process, not necessarily a drug. And that process now is something where you can then have um, a sibling uh, um, uh, uh, drugs that now will sort of benefit from previous regulatory uh, rulings. Um, I think we could see this in the RNA, in other cases of sequence. I think we could start to see this in CRISPR. Uh, I think uh, what we'll start to see is as more of biology looks like software engineering, like programming, like data, I, I think mm. we're going to start to see this transition. Um, with that said, I think it's always a mistake to sort of um, exaggerate that something will change everything. There will be elements that will have to be the same. And much like cars go through crash testing and a lot of regulatory aspects, there will still be regulatory aspects that we have to, to think about. 
and that we mm -hmm. have to be careful about. But I think the intriguing thing is um, not will we'll stay the same, but how much really could change. And, and over 20 years, a large fraction of how drugs are done, I think, could take on this textile. Great. Uh, Vijay, it's always very pleasant to, to have this dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, very much for having me.